openings, which I think is probably what I find most enjoyable about this, seeing different systems um, ranging from carbon fiber composites to microelectronics. And certainly working here at Anical Political Answers gives me an opportunity to see a wide variety of material systems. So that sounds like you really have a passion for the topic, so I'd like to hand it over to you right now. Okay. Thank you very much. I'd like to welcome all of you to the webinar today on thin film and multilayer defect analysis in metals, metal coatings, and optical coatings. And what I'd like to try and do for the next few minutes is highlight the focused ion beam technique or FIB technique and its application to uh, these areas. For those of you who may be unfamiliar with the technique, uh, it's very much analogous to scanning electron microscopy. Um, in the scanning electron microscope, we generate an electron beam that we used to probe the sample surface in focused ion beam microscopy that's replaced with a focused ion beam. Um, the most widely used source and the one that we have here is a gallium liquid metal ion source. Provides a very high brightness point source of gallium ions. There's an associated column that extracts those ions, accelerates them, uh, focuses them down onto the sample surface. Upon impact with the sample, a variety of secondary species are emitted, secondary ions, secondary electrons, and sputtered neutrals. As in the scanning electron microscope, we can collect the charged particles that are emitted, be they electrons or ions, with an appropriate detector, and by scanning the ion beam across the sample surface in a raster fashion, synchronized with the detector output, we can generate a uh, secondary ion or secondary electron image of the sample surface. Uh, secondary electrons are the most yielded species due to the impact, and those are the ones that are most frequently used to form images generate a secondary electron image, uh, essentially the same way you would in a SEM. Secondary ions can also be detected and used to form a secondary ion image. However, the yield of secondary ions is much lower, uh, so we need to use higher beam densities on the sample to get reasonable signal to noise in the resultant images, and using those higher currents can uh, lead to beam damage of the surface. So for the vast majority of cases, it's a secondary electron image that we form in the focused ion beam tool. And an, an example of that is shown here. This is uh, actually a high magnification image of the scale on a butterfly wing. You can see in the left side the secondary electron image formed using the FIB tool and on the right is the secondary electron image from the same field of view uh, image with our field emission SEM. And while the resolution is not quite as good in the FIB tool, you can see that there, you can clearly see fine detail in the image, uh, well below micron resolution. Uh, this is sufficient to get an overall uh, impression of the surface structure and can also be used to navigate to uh, additional fields of view and select areas of interest for further analysis. I'd like to spend just a couple minutes on the contrast mechanisms involved uh, in focused ion beam microscopy. The first of these is topographic, which uh, the previous image showed you an example of, where changes in the surface topography result in variations in the secondary electron intensity and give us the contrast we use to form our image. There's also material contrast in focused ion beam secondary electron images. Uh, that refers to various chemical species present in the surface of the material having different secondary electron yields. And so as you step from one material to the next in your image plane, uh, your secondary electron contrast will change. <clears throat> 
The third, which I won't spend much time on, is voltage contrast, which is a change in secondary electron intensity based on local differences in surface potential uh, get caused by local difference in surface conductivity. We actually try to avoid this contrast mechanism uh, by coating samples with a very thin layer of, of conductive material, much as is done in SEM analyses. Uh, but it's worth mentioning, and in fact, voltage contrast is a very important tool for fault isolation in microelectronics, for instance, by uh, localizing the uh, region of opens in microelectronic circuit traces. The final one, which turns out to be very important in uh, the applications we'll be talking about today, is crystallographic or channeling contrast. And I've attempted to kind of uh, demonstrate that with this little schematic here, which shows uh, crystal lattices oriented at different uh, relative orientations to the incoming primary ion beam shown here in red. You can see in this center orientation, the crystal presents a very closed, packed crystal face to the ion beam uh, and stops the primary ion beam very quickly upon entry into the sample. Uh, secondary electrons are generated then in the very near surface region and easily escape, giving us a bright contrast appearance from uh, this particular crystal orientation. Orientations shown on either side present a little bit a different situation where now the crystal lattice presents a more open face to the ion beam. Primary beam can penetrate deeply into the sample by following these relatively open uh, lattice areas and come to rest deeper in the sample. Secondary electrons generated deeper in the sample uh, are more likely to be neutralized before they can escape and be detected. And so areas where channeling uh, occurs tend to show darker contrast in the resultant image. So if we were to scan our ion beam across a polycrystalline material like this, we would go from dark to light and back to dark contrast. And that's shown here in this pair of uh, secondary electron images. These are first image on the left here is taken at zero degree tilt, so the ion beam is uh, striking the surface normal to the plane of this image. And you can see that this roughly triangular shaped grain in the center third of the image is uh, presenting a non-channeling grain orientation that results in the bright contrast. If we then tilt this sample by 10 degrees, uh, we change that situation considerably and put this grain in a more channeling orientation and you can see the contrast actually flips from light to dark. The grains surrounding it are now put in a more in a less channeling orientation than they were originally and their contrast begins to brighten. So very quickly see the uh, grain size in this sample. It turns out to be a very important contrast mechanism in FIB microscopy images from polycrystalline materials. And again, another example of that is shown in this slide where we have three different copper films, uh, all copper but with different grain sizes and grain size distributions. So the FIB imaging gives a very quick way to view these grain size and grain size distributions and certainly make some qualitative, if not quantitative, judgments about those and also investigate how those distributions might be affected by processing conditions uh, used on the various films. As uh, valuable as the top-down imaging in the FIB is, the real power of the technique uh, lies in its ability to form clean, polished cross-sectional uh, cross-sections that can then be used to investigate the structure with depth. Um, we do that simply by increasing the ion current delivered to the sample. The beam density uh, results in uh, higher rates of sputter removal of surface material. 
and we can mill into the sample to form a cross section. Um, this is particularly valuable for samples that are hard to mechanically polish or to perform cross-sectional analyses of small features, which would be extremely difficult to hit in a polished cross-section. We do need to protect our surface of interest, though, from the ion beam while we're performing this ion milling, and we do that using a uh, ion-assisted deposition mechanism. Um, in our instrument, like many FIB tools, we have an organoplatinum source, which is introduced into the vacuum system through a gas injection needle. That material adsorbs to the surface, and then wherever it's struck by the incoming ion beam, the precursor molecule dissociates, leaving us with a platinum film uh, that does contain some residual amounts of carbon from the precursor as well as some implanted gallium. Um, but we get a nice conformal protective coating over our surface of interest and we can then move on to uh, ion milling. should also note that this gas injection can also be used to inject reactant gases into the vacuum system that will actually uh, produce enhanced etching depending on the actual reactant species used. So to give you a feel for how that operates, um, this is a sample of interest. We've already applied the platinum protective coating here, this rectangular structure. Further, we've used the ion beam to mill two X-shaped fiducial marks that will help us align the position of the finished cross-section in the uh, plane of interest. And then we define a milling box and do basically a series of sequential line scans, uh, sequentially eroding material away from the surface to form a wedge-shaped final uh, cross-section with the cross-section face being right here. This is typically done using very high beam currents to mill through the material as quickly as possible in order to get a smooth polished face on our final cross section we would do some cleanup or polish mills using a much lower beam density exactly analogous to stepping to finer grades of grit in a mechanical polish section and I've shown the finished cross-section here. The left image is a top-down image. You can see we've milled partway now into our platinum cap to reach the plane of interest. And then simply by tilting the sample to 45 degrees, we expose this cross-section to the ion beam, uh, allowing it to form the secondary ion image of the final cross-section. This is just a higher magnification image of that same cross-sectional face see that the fib produces a very smooth finish on the cross section. There's very little topographical contrast in this image and instead it's dominated by material and channeling contrast. This particular sample is just a plated edge connector on a printed circuit board and you can see we have our platinum cap on the top, thin layer of gold coated on the surface of the pin, uh, a nickel layer beneath it, and the copper substrate. And our material contrast clearly delineates those layers for us. You can see the channeling contrast also is a major contributor to the contrast seen in this image. The finely grained um, gold and nickel layers just well distinguished from the more coarsely grained copper. That particular material system can pose issues when using a SEM to perform cross-sectional analyses. I've shown here a scanning electron secondary image from a similar stack, again gold, nickel, copper, um, and while you can faintly make out the interface region between the nickel and copper, it, it's difficult to clearly delineate. 
Switching to backscatter electron imaging, uh, in which contrast is produced as a function of atomic number of the various features of interest, doesn't really help us very much in this situation. Again, because of the close uh, match between nickel and copper in terms of their atomic masses. Again, in the FIB secondary ion image, channeling contrast uh, it's clearly delineates the nickel from the copper film, allows us to quickly ascertain the thicknesses of each of those layers. Just a couple of additional examples on uh, metal films and metal film stacks showing the resolution capability of the FIB microscope. The example shown on the left here is a roughly 400 nanometer nickel film that's been deposited on silicon. Uh, again, you see the film quite clearly due to the channeling contrast, which also gives you a feel for the grain sizes involved. But there's a very faint uh, but distinct layer beneath this, which is uh, on the order of 30 nanometers. Uh, this is either an adhesion layer in this particular sample or perhaps uh, we're beginning to form some nickel silicide at this uh, interface between the nickel and the silicon substrate. Another example on the right is a gold titanium bilayer sample where we have 200 nanometer gold layers separated by roughly 80 nanometer titanium films. Again, all the layers in the stack are readily distinguishable in the FIB image. And we can use the software, as we've done here, to measure the thicknesses of each of these individual films. The little XSs that are shown here in parentheses uh, denote that this is a true cross-sectional measurement, where the software has read the tilt angle that the image was acquired at from the image metadata, and then corrected this vertical measurement for the foreshortening that's produced by imaging at a non-normal tilt. Move for a minute to an example of defects in metal stacks. Shown here images from two samples that are ostensibly the same construction. You see this top layer, which is a relatively fine-grained nickel, on top of a more coarsely-grained nickel, on top of brass, uh, and in this left-hand example, all those films are fairly planar uh, and act to produce an acceptable surface finish on this part. In contrast, on the right side of the page, you can see a sample that exhibits poor surface finish. And again, despite the fact that these are exactly the same material in terms of being nickel films, the channeling contrast quickly highlights the difference in this base layer of nickel where you see this nodular growth uh, leading to very large uh, protrusions from that base layer, which the fine grain nickel subsequently applied is unable to sufficiently planarize and then leads to the poor observed surface finish. Again, this would be very difficult, if not impossible, to see in the SEM because of you're essentially looking at the two materials that are the, the same. As I've tried to point out, the FIB provides us a very high resolution imaging tool and we can use that resolution now to look for localized defects. Um, shown an example here in an optical coating where the defect is um, seen on the surface as a roughly micronish dimensioned dome. We can precisely cross-section this with the FIB after locating it, and we can see that the genesis of this defect is actually a buried particle uh, very near the beginning of the multi-layer stack used in this optical coating. And upon going to higher magnification, this particle is on the order of half a micron in dimension. As powerful as the FIB is as a standalone tool, it's, we frequently use it in combination with the scanning electron microscope. 
Um, SEM offers several advantages. You have a variety of imaging conditions that can be used, allowing you to be very flexible in your analysis and optimize it for the particular sample at hand. Uh, it does provide higher resolution imaging. Um, this defect that I'm showing here is the same one that I previously showed on the prior slide from the FIB image. There's also no concern now with sputter damage as we move to higher magnification. Again, in the FIB, we do use low beam currents when we're doing the FIB imaging, but as you go to higher magnification, that current is squeezed into a smaller and smaller raster dimension, which results in higher beam density, which can then produce sputter damage on your sample. And we also have the ability to perform other analyses, uh, most notably energy dispersive X-ray spectroscopy, which allows us to start to get a handle on the actual composition of the features that we're seeing, in addition to just the structure and morphology. Showing here just a couple of quick examples of SEM images on some very thin uh, film stacks. Image on the left is that same gold titanium bilayer structure that I previously showed you. Uh, you can see the increase in resolution that's provided. You can also see how clean the FIB cross section is here where there's very little, if any, smearing of the soft gold layer. Um, we can start to see some of the grain structure again within the gold as well as some embedded voids. Um, this would be difficult to do with conventional polished cross-sectioning. Similarly, on the right is a six-layer optical coating, um, a variety of materials and layer thicknesses. The SEM is able to resolve all of them and again a very clean cross-section with uh, no artifacts seen on it. Finally, another buried defect, this one extremely small, 60 nanometers uh, as measured on this image. Um, you can see that as it replicates up through the film stack that it expands slightly and that gives us a feature size that's sufficient to locate using the high resolution imaging capability of the FIB. And then the fine focused FIB beam allows for a very precise cross section uh, to catch this defect core. Again, extremely difficult if not impossible to do with a polished cross section. So as I mentioned, now we've seen some features of interest in some of these defects and layers when we'd like to take it one step further and start to investigate the composition. Um, and we do that using energy dispersive X-ray spectroscopy. Again, the incident electron beam causes X-ray emission from the various atoms present in the sample. Um, these X-rays have a energy which is characteristic of the element that emitted them. And so if we monitor X-ray intensity as a function of X-ray energy, we generate a spectrum with a series of peaks which we can then assign to the various elements present in the area under analysis. Um, the software package also provides for spectral imaging in which a complete X-ray spectrum as shown above is acquired at each pixel of the image and then you can go back and select various elements to generate maps of the distribution of that element within the surface, within this image as I've done here by selecting the silicon peak and showing its distribution. Again, this is that same roughly spherical half micronish particle that I've shown you a couple of images of already. Alternatively, since we have a spectrum at each point, we can select various areas of interest within this image and reconstruct the spectrum uh, from them so that we can identify their composition. This shows an example of that spectral imaging in a 
again in the case of a buried defect in an optical coating. This is the SEM image from that defect. And our SEM EDX shows the calcium, which is shown here in green, as well as magnesium, where the yellow spots is localized within the defect site. Neither of those materials are part of the film compositions that are used in this optical stack, so it implies that we have a foreign contaminant species that was introduced uh, very near the beginning of the DEP, or potentially uh, there was insufficient surface cleaning before the DEP began, uh, which led to the production of this particular defect. Another example here, we're moving to an even smaller feature, this one approximately a quarter micron, again, a buried defect in an optical stack. I've shown here the silicon and niobium maps, which are uh, the oxides that are used in this stack. And you can see that while we can make out the particle and the sort of the layer structure that as we increase the magnification here, these elemental maps start to wash out in terms of resolution. Um, you know, we can't really maintain the same resolution that we see in the SEM. And that's due to the fundamentals of the uh, emission mechanics from the x-rays. And that's shown here in this simulation that shows the electron trajectories of a uh, electron beam impacting on the sample surface of a bulk aluminum uh, at this position. If you think of the top surface of this schematic as the cross-sectional face of the sample, uh, our electron beam is striking at this position. Uh, the majority of secondary electrons are emitted from uh, essentially right around the point of impact, but our primary electrons can penetrate deeply into the sample, and X-rays can be generated from uh, throughout this zone. Once they're generated, they escape from the sample and are detected by our detector, so you can see that in terms of uh, lateral resolution, the beam spread of our incident primary beam results in a much degraded spatial resolution. Uh, when we're trying to generate these EDX elemental maps. We can attempt to overcome that beam spread by going to thinner samples. Um, if we remove the bulk of the material, we remove the bulk of this additional scattering and X-ray generation. And if we go to extremely thin sections, uh, we enter the realm of electron transparency where our incident electron beam can travel completely through the sample and the beam spread is minimized. Um, this is known as scanning transmission electron microscopy since the electrons are being transmitted completely through the sample. And the FIB tool offers us a uh, relatively easy way to generate these thin sections. And then I've shown sort of the steps involved in that in this slide. Um, in this upper left image, this is our traditional FIB box, which would be milled to expose this cross-sectional face. Uh, so this would be the face of interest. We then mill a second box on the back side to remove the bulk of the back side material and create a very thin sliver. The slifter is then lift completely out of the sample using a probe, which is also uh, resonant inside the FIB vacuum system. Uh, we just deposit a little bit of the platinum material here to glue this sliver to the probe and then retract it out of the sample. We then move that over to another sample holder, in this case a TEM grid, and again use platinum to secure it to the grid and cut away the probe, leaving us with a freestanding sliver, which we then go back and do final milling to achieve 
the electron transparency. And you can see this example, and the buried defect is just visible here in the center of the sliver. So shown here then is the same uh, defect that I showed you earlier that had the calcium and magnesium contamination in the defect zone. Um, this secondary electron image was taken with a detector that sits above the sample surface. Uh, it looks much like a traditional SEM image of the sample showing the layer structures. We're in a slightly different um, cross-sectional plane now due to the thinning and we've exposed a void in the layers. Shown on the right is the scanning transmission electron image of the same field of view taken with a detector which sits below the sample. Uh, you can see that the relative contrast has flipped as the uh, silicon oxide film that shows dark on this image is more electron transparent in the thin section, so it shows a brighter contrast. In comparison, the niobium film um, is more electron opaque and shows as darker. I've also put a couple of measurements on here to give you an idea of the dimensions that we're looking at here. Uh, 50 to 70 nanometers in some of these features. And in this slide I've showed the change in the elemental mapping capability that's produced by going to this thin section. This image on the left is the composite map of silicon and niobium, silicon being purple and the niobium being yellow. This is from our original cross-section, single-faced cross-section, what we imaged at a 60-degree tilt. And again, you can see that while you can make out the various features, uh, it's very poor resolution. Moving to the stem sample, we essentially maintain the resolution produced in our stem image in the elemental map that we're able to produce. Um, again, as a reminder, this is a 68 nanometer layer that's well resolved from uh, the niobium layers that are above and below it. So I think you'll agree with me that the difference here is dramatic and uh, for very small features, well worth the effort. As I mentioned earlier, we can also extract spectra from various regions within the image. I've done that here, uh, looking at the silicon oxide layer that's immediately above the void in this sample. So the red areas highlighted here have been used to form a composite spectrum. And once again, you can see that in addition to our silicon oxide and a little contribution from the overlaying niobium, uh, we're seeing that same calcium and magnesium contamination as well now as a little sodium and potassium. Uh, the copper we see here is due to the grid, the TEM grid that's used to introduce this sample into the SEM. But again, you can see that we've, we're just picking up all these contaminant elements, uh, again suggesting either a introduction of a contaminant in the process or insufficient cleaning prior to the deposition uh, causing this buried defect. This is a second example of the stem analysis. This is a um, color shifting ink. So you have an organic ink matrix in which these inorganic platelets uh, are embedded and depending on the orientation of these platelets to incident light, it will shift the color that's observed in this ink. Um, I just want to point out briefly that, you know, this is a hard, relatively hard material embedded in a soft matrix, and yet the FIB is able to produce very clean cross-section of this material uh, with very little artifact. 
The secondary electron image generated in the FIB is shown at right to give you an idea of the dimensions of these uh, plates. And you can also see that there's a layered structure present within them. Moving now to the results of preparing this uh, for STEM analysis. Show, the STEM image is shown here on the left. Um, so it's a multi-layered structure as we expected based on our FIB imaging. You have a central layer surrounded by thicker layers on each side and then a final coating on the top and bottom surfaces. Our EDX spectral imaging maps directly to the STEM image. You can see the resolution in the image is preserved quite well in this spectral image that shows the central material to be aluminum with magnesium fluoride on either side and then a chromium oxide layer deposited on top and bottom. Again, a, a direct imaging of a 20 nanometer uh, film compositional imaging. We're able to produce that by using this STEM technique. So in summary, I hope I've shown you some of the advantages and capabilities that the focused ion beam technique brings to uh, investigations on these types of materials. Again, the FIB microscopy offers some very distinct advantages while we're looking at crystalline and polycrystalline films due to the strong channeling contrast that's seen in images from those materials. The high resolution imaging capability of the FIB allows us to precisely locate cross sections either um, using very fine probe beams to section through very small particles and to locate these localized defects. And again the FIB allows us to relatively simply prepare cross sections that would be very difficult to do using conventional polished cross-sectioning um, because of the ability to hit the precise location of interest. And finally, the combination of using the FIB sample prep with uh, SEM or STEM analyses gives us a ultra-high resolution imaging capability uh, and the ability to map sample composition at comparable resolutions, allowing us to identify unknown phases and the chemical composition of the various structures that we're observing. With that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and uh, open the session up for questions. Very briefly before I do that, though, I want to uh, give you a heads up on the upcoming webinar topics uh, in 2017. The schedule is shown he here, where in the middle of January we'll be talking about visualizing the hydration and dehydration using wet scanning electron microscopy. February, video real-time microscopy of moving components, and in March, uh, failure analysis of printed circuit boards and electronic components. So with that, again, I'd like to thank you for your attention and open it up for questions. So the first question I have is, are there any materials that you can't use this technique on? Um, Fundamentally, there are a couple of limitations, as you might expect. Uh, this is a vacuum technique, so samples that are, aren't vacuum compatible uh, can't be introduced into the vacuum. Um, similarly, we're using an ion beam, so if the sample is subject to ion beam-induced decomposition, um, we're going to have a tough time getting reliable results from that. Other than that, there aren't really any restrictions. Um, the, 
the quality of the finished cross section can be material dependent. Uh, so some materials are harder to get clean, polished cross sections on using the FIB, but uh, there aren't really many materials that we can't use this technique on. So that kind of ties into another question here, which is can I use the FIB to characterize multi-layer polymer films or coated polymer films? Um, again, the answer to that question is yes, given the caveats that I mentioned previously in that the samples do need to be able to stand up to the ion beam and to be compatible with the vacuum system. How small an area can you do EDS on using this method? So I showed in the um, stem example, our stem sample is roughly 10 microns in terms of the electron transparent region. Um, so we can mag up within that 10 microns. Uh, I gave you an example that showed you a 20 nanometer film, for instance, that we were able to get a clear EDS resolution on. Um, so I would say on the order of a few nanometers, we would be able to generate EDX data. Can the FIB give quantitative measurements on the elements present? Um, we can certainly use the quantitation available within the EDS software uh, and convert our measured intensities to either atomic or weight percent. So yes, we can make quantitative measurements. Can I use the FIB on semiconductor IC devices to perform circuit modifications? Uh, yeah, that is certainly one, uh, one use that the FIB finds uh, in semiconductors uh, in diagnostics or early development. You can cut metal lines uh, and deposit metal to form new circuit traces. You can remove dielectric material and again deposit the platinum metal. Uh, so yes, circuit modification is one high use area of FIB tools in the microelectronics industry. Cost drivers. Sample preparations, typical cost for these analyses. So um, in terms of cost, the, the typical FIB cross-section takes about an hour start to finish. Uh, that gives you a roughly 30 to 50 micron cross-sectional face. Uh, again, if you want to go larger or deeper, that obviously will take more time, um, but it's relatively quick to get a cross-section preparation in the FIB tool. If we move to uh, stem preparation, that's going to take a good deal longer given all the milling and sample manipulation that's involved. On the other hand, if we're doing that, we're typically looking at very small features and uh, there's likely very little alternative uh, sample preparation that can be applied to actually get those samples into the SEM for characterization. Yes. Well, thanks for that fantastic webinar. Um, we're here for another about 10 minutes. If you keep, keep those questions coming, if you have any.
um, we're definitely here to answer them. Um, otherwise, if you have a question that occurs to you later, feel free to email answers at analyticalanswersinc.com and we'll get, you know, we'll get you the answers that you need. Also want to remind everybody again, upcoming topics, January 17th, visualizing hydration and dehydration of pharmaceuticals, foodstuffs, and other materials using wet scanning electron microscopy. February 7th, looking inside, video real-time microscopy of moving components for failure analysis. And March 17th, art of failure analysis of printed circuit boards and electronic components, root causes versus all those darned red herrings. Um, again, if a question occurs to you later on, feel free to email answers at analyticalanswersinc.com. Uh, this webinar has been recorded. It's going to be made available to everybody um, within about 48 hours. So if you missed a point, if you want to review it, if you want to share it with your colleagues, please do share both this webinar and upcoming ones with interested colleagues, students, people that you want to share this information with because that's what this is here for. Um, it looks like we don't have any more questions coming in. So again, we want to really thank you for participating in the last live webinar of 2016. Watch for an email with both the recording of this webinar and our pre-recorded December webinar that you can watch at your leisure uh, during the busy holiday season. Thanks again, Bill Harris, for a really dynamic webinar. And uh, thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Take care till next time.